listeners in central Plymouth County, this is KQNY 91.9 FM, a listener-supported community radio station. Welcome to The Common Good, a local community affairs program. Our mission is to provide a forum so that the citizens of our communities might be better informed on past or current matters of public interest. Our approach to do so is in an objective, nonpartisan way and to permit persons of differing views to speak in their own voice. And we accomplish this by having them as guests on the program. This is Joseph Munoz speaking, your host and moderator. The Common Good will air the first and third Tuesday of each month at 10 a.m. and be replayed on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. the same week. Those programs will replay the second and fourth weeks of the month and I invite you to listen. The people of the 21st century live in a very different environment compared to those in the past. This is particularly true when we consider the nature of the spaces we inhabit and how they're affected by electronic technology. Radio frequency electromagnetic fields exist in our homes due to the smart technology in much of our modern appliances, computer Wi-Fi, refrigerators, microwave ovens, television hardware, and mobile cellular phones, just to name a few examples. These generate RF waves. Cell towers dot the urban and rural landscape to provide mobile phone and internet services. These are often disguised as artificial trees and I believe they're done so to look innocuous. Most of us do not stand in front of an operating microwave oven, and many restaurants have interior signs warning patrons that a microwave oven is in operation because these may affect heart pacemakers. Microwave ovens give off hot radio frequency waves, but most people do not give a thought to the RF energy fields that are by contrast cool. Household appliances powered by microwave radio frequencies and wireless signals penetrate our private and public interiors. We do not often consider whether some of these forms of technology might be harmful. We tend to trust government regulators to provide layers of protection from things that are harmful as it does for pharmaceutical drugs or rancid meat. But as in the past, it may be that things we consider safe are actually potentially harmful or dangerous. Such was the case with lead, chloroform, DDT, asbestos, and cigarette smoke, all corporately hailed as safe and yet dangerous. This morning we will consider the meters that measure our use of electricity and send various other forms of data to the utility companies that have installed them. The meters that have been traditionally used are analog. They were and are free of electronics and Wi-Fi signals. Smart meters gather data for remote reporting. Advanced metering infrastructure, AMI meters, permit a two-way communications with the meter 24 hours a day. Automatic meter reading, AMR, systems permit data to be collected when a meter reader drives by and receives a radio frequency data transmission. These have been introduced ostensibly for a wide variety of reasons. The Obama administration considers smart meters and the smart grid a feature of his green power initiatives. His administration has rigorously embraced this initiative with federal stimulus funds to utility companies, believing that smart meters will alter household, business, and industrial uses of electricity during peak usage hours, save people money, and improve utility data management. Smartphones and the smart grid are now a worldwide phenomenon and have contributed, according to business and corporations, as 
leading to dramatic improvements in their marketing capabilities, whether they're a small company or a large company. Pluma Sierra Rural Electric Cooperative has a website with a section on their meters. The site poses the following question. Does PSREC have smart meters? And they answer an unqualified no, because their meters are not AMI, but radio meters or AMR. And I quote from their website, sources of RF in everyday life are varied and include television and radio stations with common sources in Plumas, Sierra, Lassen, Washoe counties being broadcast towers for Ver Verizon 4G, Verizon 3G, AT&T 3G, T-Mobile 3G, along with U.S. cellular and other secondary wireless providers and other broadcasters. These are all powerful RF sources. Still significant are cell phones, Wi-Fi routers, and laptops. PSREC's radio meters are a very weak source of RF exposure, according to the cooperative. And the answer that they provided uh, regarding the kind of meters that they have goes on to say, there are no scientific studies showing that RF affects the human body at the levels approved by the FCC. And PSREC's radio em uh, meters emit much lower levels of RF than approved FCC limits. Now, leaving their website, I'll return to my own analysis. The PSREC website also declares that if you wish to have an analog meter installed, you may have one if you pay and pay in advance for the cost of travel, labor, and the cost of the analog meter. And then pay an opt-out fee of $15 for a month. And I can recall when I first um, considered this a year ago, I was a bit surprised about this because uh, I didn't have any choice at all in whether or not they replaced my analog meter, which happened evidently many years ago. And yet, if I want to change that out, I have to pay to go back to the meter I had in the first place. Last October, after having uh, Mr. Joshua Hart, who's the National Director of Stop Smart Meters, on the common good, I called the office of Bob Marshall, the general manager, of PSREC, and I left a message that I would air a second interview if he wished to have the cooperative send a representative to state their point of view on these matters, and I did not hear back from Mr. Marshall. Mr. Hart uh, is, uh, again, a guest on my program. He's a native of the Bay Area who now lives in eastern Plumas County, and as I said, he's an opponent of the growing use of wireless electricity meters or smart meters that emit pulsed radio frequency waves. He is a professional advocate of efforts to stop the use of these meters, opposing their use on many grounds. Some of these are health related and some are due to privacy and the growing political power of corporations. This is KQNY 91.9 FM, Plumas Community Radio and you are listening to The Common Good, a local public affairs program. I am Joseph Munoz, your host. My engineer is Tommy Miles, the station manager. The views expressed on this program are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of Plumas Community Radio. Thank you, Joshua, for being on the program again. Thank you, Joseph, for having me back on. I really appreciate it. Uh, Joshua, you shared with us last year that you and your wife moved to Plumas County due to your own medically diagnosed electrohypersensitivity. What is EHS and what lifestyle changes have you made in coping with this condition? Well, first of all, Joseph, every cell that is a living cell is electrosensitive. Uh, cells communicate using electrical pulses and they would be uh, clinically dead. Um, if if they did not. So that is a, an established fact. And there are literally thousands of peer-reviewed scientific studies that 
uh, reveal uh, serious impacts and changes to uh, cells, living cells, from levels of RF radiation that are be- that are below what the FCC allows. So PSREC's claim that uh, there are no scientific studies showing harm is is patently false. It is not true, and we could demonstrate that uh, multiple times. There is uh, a, a phenomena of electro hypersensitivity where a person. Uh, is more uh, than usual sensitive to electromagnetic fields, including radio frequency RF. Uh, And this can be caused either by some sort of genetic predisposition or by an injury. And I believe uh, I was injured by radiation from 80, bank of 80 PG&E smart meters back in 2011. We talked about this last time. Uh, This was an acute exposure, very high radiation, um, it sensitized me to other so forms. So this is due to where you lived at the time? I went, uh, this is about a year after we started StopSmartMeters.org and about a year after PG&E started deploying in the Bay Area at the request of a um, senior citizen lady living in a low-income housing unit in Berkeley. Uh, she contacted us, sent us some photos of a shrub that had died about a month or two after PG&E had installed their smart meters. Uh, It was right adjacent to the bank of meters. So we went with a device, we measured the levels, found that they were very, very high. And uh, more or less since then, I've been sensitive to Wi-Fi, cell phones. I just can't tolerate being around them without getting headaches, feeling nauseous, really unpleasant symptoms. So this is something that is, as we see more and more cell towers go up and more and more wireless devices being used, including in inappropriate ways, we see the the numbers of people who are reporting electrohypersensitivity on the increase. And unlike a regular disability or an ordinary disability, um, you know, the, the, the people who are electrohypersensitive are completely fine if they're not exposed to um, RF radiation. So I can go out in the forest and be completely symptom-free in an area away from um, this kind of radiation. But I come into a cafe, you know, go out to dinner, there's someone with a cell phone next to me, I can feel it. Uh, and it's, it's unpleasant, you know. Uh, it's it's not, not, not a, a pleasant thing. But uh, you know, I think we need to, instead of saying, oh, well, these poor people, we need to, you know, take care of them, which we do. We need to, you know, establish uh, white zones that are free of radiation so that people can live safely. Uh, and we need to uh, question the uh, unrestrained proliferation of, of, of wireless uh, equipment in our public spaces because uh, the ele- people who are electrohypersensitive uh, are essentially canaries in the coal mine warning the rest of us uh, that there are serious problems, uh, health problems and environmental problems, we, most of us may not be feeling those, uh, that damage occurring, but it is in fact occurring, and an increasing number of us can actually feel it. Uh, so the rest of us who, 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 may, who may not be uh, able to feel that should, should really take note. Uh, but in terms of how we've coped, how I've coped uh, with this, it's been very difficult and very scary. Uh, we've had to move to remote locations. Um, I, before be, getting involved in this issue, I was uh, very much involved in the transportation issue. I lived 11 years without a car, car free in the Bay Area, using my bicycle and public transport. I really like to, to do that still, but um, you know, at, at the point when I when I became sick, it became necessary to own a vehicle to get to a remote location where I didn't feel sick all the time. So I, you know, that that's very uh, frustrating to me. Uh, we, you know, I've cut out my cell phone. I don't use Wi-Fi at, at the house. We do have a corded landline and corded Ethernet. Uh, internet doesn't use wireless. Don't use microwaves or cordless phones or any uh, any of that type of thing. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, we moved to Plumas County uh, back in 2013 uh, because this, you know, relatively this is a good location uh, with 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 few wireless signals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, all right. Thank you. Um, so once you relocated and you did these things to try to create an environment which was uh, safer for you and more comfortable for you. Um, What led to you having your electricity in your home cut off for 16 months? Well, uh, we moved into our home in Eastern Plumas uh, in August of 2013, 
and uh, immediately contacted PSREC because there was a smart AMR meter on our house that was constantly pulsing RF radiation. We, I, we have a device, uh, a, a Cornet EMF meter, and we actually sell these on our website, uh, stopsmartmeters.org. We were measuring levels from this meter that would violate uh, limits in, in many European countries. Uh, this is not, these are not low levels. These are very, very, very high levels of RF radiation uh, that transmit constantly. We contacted PSREC, uh, demanded that they remove the meter. Uh, I explained that I have a, a medical condition, uh, electrohypersensitivity. I pr provided. How is this measured, Joshua? I, I remember you saying that you had a physician in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. How did she measure this? Well, uh, there's a lot of medical conditions, like uh, you know, when you get a migraine, for example. There is no objective test to, to test whether someone has a migraine or not. It is purely uh, reliant on self-report. Mm. So so, so uh, after talking with her, after explaining, you know, how I noticed that my symptoms are correlated with exposure to electromagnetic fields, mm -hmm. uh, uh, basically my doctor uh, uh, diagnosed me with electrohypersensitivity and uh, wrote that letter back in, you know, uh, 2013 to PSREC saying that the, uh, an analog is medically necessary. Mm -hmm. So based on that, they came out and within two days, they replaced the meter with an anal a pure analog mm -hmm. meter. And uh, there was never any mention of fees or of you know anything anything like that. Uh, and then we were so we were surprised in October of 2013 that these bills, these additional fees. Now, if I could stop you just for a moment, so they replaced the meter and and didn't even say that you would have to pay for the cost of replacing the meter. No labor there, anything. There was like never that. any mention of that. They and, just and came and replaced. At the that meter. point, there was no official opt-out policy um, with PSREC. Uh, and there were, there, are, there, are, there were and are many people who continue to self-read their analog meter in Plumas County and, and Sierra County without an extra fee because uh, it's inconvenient for whatever reason for PSREC to, to read it. Mm -hmm. So we were billed this amount, $141.60 and then $15 a month. And we uh, went in and met with Bob Marshall and the board of directors explained uh, that we believed that the fee was inappropriate, that it was in fact illegal under state law. Uh, and that's uh, because of a couple of state laws. One that says that you can't, that utilities cannot charge more for safety. And these meters are, are, are dangerous uh, on a number of different levels. Uh, and that another uh, public utilities code that says that you cannot charge more based on medical condition. Mm. So we explained this, we showed them the letter from my doctor. I presented the evidence, uh, and they just refused to consider it. Um, they refused to uh, consider the possibility of allowing people in Plumas County to self-read their analog meter, which doesn't cost them any extra um, without any charge. This, and this, this is really a coercive uh, attempt to force people to adopt the kind of meter that's convenient for them without really looking at the scientific uh, evidence of harm that these are causing to the whole community. So we, uh, we, we told them that we would decline to pay the additional fee. We continue to pay our, our uh, base rate, the amount for the electricity that we used. Uh, and finally, in February, uh, so I think I talked to you in October of, of 2014, uh, 2014. That's correct. After I'd been, uh, we'd been living without electricity for about a year, we're going into our second year of, of, of um, living, you know, off the grid in an all-electric rental. Um, but, yeah, so basically in, this was February 2014, Bob Marshall, uh, director of the, of the cooperative, gave the order uh, to disconnect us um, for non-payment of, the, of their fees. Fee. Uh, and he says for refusing access to the meter. Um, and we never at any point refused access for them to read the meter, to examine the meter, to maintain the meter. Uh, we always uh, were very clear that that was permitted. But when they showed up at our house and that day uh, and said, you know, we are, we are going to install a smart meter, and they knew, based on my doctor's letter, that this kind of meter made me sick, of course we're going to refuse access to them um, for the, under those conditions. So we were disconnected. Uh, in February 2014 and uh, attempted to meet with the, the cooperative, uh, the board, attempted to, you know, we spoke with the Board of Supervisors, Portola City Council, 
Uh, and you know, we were, our hope was that common sense would prevail and that community pressure would result in them reconnecting us. That did not happen. So in January uh, of this year, of 2015, we filed a small claims uh, case and uh, uh, went into small claims court. Uh, and basically, uh, long story short, uh, the judge, Judge Hildy, uh, ruled that uh, that charging us the fees, as PSREC had been doing, violated... Just the opt-out fees or all the fees? The, any additional the, fees. So the cost of the analog yeah, meter, the, cost of the, analog the meter. labor, and, or any of that charging? Any additional any of that. fees that they're charging to us based mm. on our use of an analog meter were, in fact, illegal under California Public Utility Code 453B mm. because my... Um, my medical condition required that an analog meter be installed. Uh, so um, obviously PSREC was not happy with that uh, decision. They appealed to Superior Court here in Plumas County. So we, uh, we started preparing for a major lawsuit and a confrontation with them. We recruited uh, my doctor who was willing to come up and testify. Um, expert witnesses on the, sub on the subject of RF health impacts, including Martin Paul, who is with the University of Washington uh, and has studied uh, the, the, the biological details of actually how RF uh, damages cells and can produce symptoms of electro hypersensitivity. Uh, so we listed those, those witnesses. We were ready to go into court. We were ready to, to you know, make our case. And PSREC responded to the court, said, they, they do not dispute my medical condition. So I thought that was really interesting because Number one, it was, seemed likely that they, they made that statement to avoid the publicity of a victory on health grounds and the publicity that uh, their loss um, would, would, would cause. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's curious because when they say, well, they do not dispute that I have electrosensitivity, what they're essentially admitting is that their meters and their equipment that uses RF wireless technology can cause people harm. And I think that's quite a significant admission on their part. Um, but the associated policy uh, uh, changes that would be sensible, given that acceptance of electrohypersensitivity, are not forthcoming. And those would include really a phasing out of wireless equipment that they're using, uh, and at least a free choice uh, so that people aren't, aren't uh, burdened with high fees that many can't afford simply to protect their health and safety. Uh, so uh, they appealed. They dropped their claim that, that, that they, they, you know, they say they, they did not dispute my medical condition. We went into court here in Quincy on June 29th of this year and uh, had Judge Warner. Uh, and he, at the beginning of the trial, he basically admitted that he himself, the judge, self-reads his analog meter for no extra charge and is a PSREC customer. And so it came out that there are a number, we don't know an exact number because they refuse to tell us, but hundreds, perhaps thousands of customers who, for whatever reason, they have a long driveway, it's inconvenient for PSREC to go and, and read it. Uh, they have analog meters that they self-read and they call in the readings. Um, and this is offered uh, to some people, but not to others. And so for PSREC to offer this service to people when it's convenient for PSREC, uh, but not when it's medically necessary for a customer uh, is really a serious issue. And I think that everyone realized that they did not have a case, not only uh, because they give the analog to certain people and not to others. Well, their, their site, their website, as I remember, says that it has to do with the distance from the road. And uh, if, they're, if the radio transmitters that are in the trucks that their people are driving can easily read the meter, then they charge, you know, if you have mm -hmm. an analog, and if mm -hmm. they don't, if they can't, mm -hmm. then they allow a self-report, which, right. which was the standard practice for years and years and years. And a self-report, it m makes sense on a lot of different levels. Uh, you know, it, it saves them the cost of going, sending someone out, a meter reader, to go mm -hmm. and read the meter. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, you know, it saves resources. And if they have a concern about someone underpaying or cheating on their, their reading, they can always send someone can, out every drop, six months and to, to verify to the readings. Yeah. Once in a long while to my my house, I can remember that and just check to see if we were being current. With yeah. Our, so Judge Hildy mm -hmm. in the first ruling basically said, you know, uh, PSREC's 
claim that they are going to be defrauded ab about the, the amount is not does not stand up because they always have the option of discontinuing service if someone's not paying their bill, going to check that the that the meter uh, readings are being submitted accurately. Mm -hmm. So it's really a kind of a lack of trust of PSREC of the community. Uh, feeling like everyone is out to get them, out to defraud them. Um, and I, I just don't think that's the case. I think, um, you know, people need to be able to make a choice about what technology they're comfortable with on their home uh, without a fee. And particularly because the uh, cooperative, and I put that, that, that term in quotes, uh, uh, particularly because they did not ask the community, they did not have consultations when they made this this switch from analog to predominantly um, smart meter technology. Well, I think they, they could argue that they have annual meetings where any cooperative member can attend and they raise their policy mm -hmm. questions to the membership and they have votes mm -hmm. by the membership who are in attendance at those meetings. Yeah, I mean, the PSREC is ostensibly a cooperative and they're ostensibly uh, 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 responsive to the community that they serve. However, uh, there are there, there's really a, 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 a chronic issue with co electric cooperatives across the country that have um, become less democratic over time. Um, if you looked at the ballot that was sent out with the annual meeting materials this last year, there were no choices with regard to who you elect for on the, the board of directors. Uh, each each candidate um, was the sole uh, candidate for, for office, so there's no choice there. Well, uh, if it's a white ballot, if no one wants to run against mm -hmm. the current uh, board member that that's that's a standard practice typically and in in a, in, a, in elections where you do have a white ballot there may be a line where you can have a write-in candidate and mm -hmm. I don't know whether or not they mm -hmm. had that or not I think you know uh, regardless the, the the turnout for the election was really low it said in the paper I think it was less than five less than five or ten percent um, I wouldn't be surprised and you know I think um, th there's a uh, a real lack of um, responsiveness from the board, at least, you know, coming in with, with a really, um, you know, w w we wanted to work with them. We, ha we gave them the benefit of the doubt. When we first moved here, we were, you know, um, happy that we didn't have a, a big battle in just getting the smart meter mm -hmm. off of our house. Uh, so we went and met with them, gave them the benefit of the doubt, but really they were not responsive uh, at all to either uh, the, con the concerns and the problems that I brought up or um, the multiple other people. Uh, who are bringing up similar issues. Uh, so there, there's a number of, of, of issues in the way that the cooperative is functioning that are, you know, problematic. And these include, you know, wasting members' money on frivolous lawsuits to defend their discriminatory practices Now, this so June 29th decision, um, was that a court decision or was there just a um, arbitration that took place in that, in that superior court setting? So what happened uh, is that... The judge admitted that you know he self reads his analog, and mm -hmm. we had a witness there um, who also self reads his analog for mm -hmm. no charge. He lives mm -hmm. just half a mile away from us, mm -hmm. so really the same community. Uh, and it was clear, I think, to PSREC and to the judge that their case was falling apart. They um, could not justify continuing to charge us and, in fact, disconnecting us, which is something that PG&E and the other investor-owned utilities have never done, mm. disconnecting solely for refusing to pay the opt-out fee. This is a draconian uh, move on, on the part of the cooperative. Uh, but it was clear that their case was falling apart, that they were relying on the California Public Utilities Commission ruling that affected smart meters and only for PG&E and the other investor-owned utilities. They've consistently claimed that they do not have smart meters. So they're really trying to have their cake and eat it too, um, saying that you know they're not smart meters when they want to avoid the bad reputation that smart meters have, but saying that they are smart meters when they want to fall under the jurisdiction of the CPUC. So we called them on that. Um, it was obvious that you know their their case was falling apart. So at that point, they offered to settle with us and to turn on our electricity, to drop all past charges, to not charge us any future fees, to uh, allow us to self-read our analog at no charge uh, until such time as our our analog was the last analog in their service territory. And so they several so we verbally agreed to that because that is what we have been seeking, just a ba you know fair treatment. Uh, uh, you know, no one should pay for the analog, and we, we were not about to start. Uh, so we verbally agreed to that settlement. 
the settlement is still not finalized. The settlement this was state. for you, though, not for everyone, as I understand. That's correct. That correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the, this case was, you know, specific to to us yes. on our personal case. Okay. Uh, and so when they offered to um, reconnect us, to drop the fees, to continue to allow us to self-read our analog, um, we said, okay, that that's acceptable to us. Uh, and we would negotiate a, a written settlement. And that's been going back and forth since June 29th. Now it's you know, beginning of October. You've got your power back on. We've got our pa- we got our power back on. I think it was the July 4th weekend. Um, they they turned okay. they came and, and turned us back on, and we've been self reading uh, since then. Uh, but there's some dis- ongoing dispute regarding the details. Uh, uh, they, uh, their plan, you know, we hear from other customers who are talking to them, is that they want to eliminate all the analogs that are self read in the county just put in smart meters, mm-hmm. even though they're totally inappropriate and not functionally appropriate for the, the these situations and mm-hmm. don't even work in some of these long driveways, just so they can come in, come back and say, you know, we're going to install a smart meter, or you're going to have to pay a fee, and then this whole thing, uh, you know, will hopefully not repeat itself, but that's looking like the direction that they are going, and uh, we are, we've respond to them for the written settlement proposal and uh, they still haven't gotten back to us so so it's still uh, still not completely resolved but we do Partly have our satisfied. we do have our electricity back on mm-hmm. you know we are able to, to get mm-hmm. on with our lives and uh, yeah. uh, but we are, we're awaiting a final written settlement but if that's if that's not forthcoming and if it doesn't reflect what was verbally said in court we remain ready to go back to trial to have the trial uh, and to prevail okay okay in court all right thank you uh, let's let's look at this uh, question from a, a broader perspective. Why does your organization uh, stop smart meters? Advocate eliminating uh, all forms of smart meters. Uh, what risks, in your opinion, are associated with the use of electronic devices and appliances that emit radio frequency energy? You've partly addressed this, but mm-hmm. there may be some things about this that. Uh, that you have not addressed? Well, first of all, you know, the claims that are being made about smart meters and the smart grid that they're somehow green or will somehow save energy or get people to be more aware of the energy usage are patently not true. And the evidence, the independent evidence just does not support those uh, those uh, goals being realized by the existing technology that's being deployed. Pardon me, Joshua, that meaning that the actual uses of electricity haven't declined and right. people's costs haven't gone down. Right. So. The costs have gone up. Mm-hmm. Uh, the um, the uh, energy consumption in many cases has increased. Uh, and that's for a number of different reasons. One is that the smart meters actually consume electricity. Uh, the manufacturing of, of millions uh, of new meters consumes electricity. Mm-hmm. Um, the wire, wireless technology in general is a huge carbon has a huge carbon footprint and huge energy demands. Um, cellular uh, tower technology, uh, you know, each smart meter uh, actually consumes energy to operate. Uh, and, and so you're, you're adding millions of new power consuming devices and claiming that these will somehow save electricity. That it's just not true. An analog meter would have to have some power use as well though it's more of a passive use though it's mm-hmm. a, with an electromechanical meter you don't have electronics that need power you don't have transmitters that require mm-hmm. power you just have a spinning disk that um, mm-hmm. basically passively records the electricity usage okay. so um, so number one they don't do what they what they're claimed what they what, what their proponents uh, claim that they do uh, and there are all these additional risks uh, that they create and uh, hazards that they create. First of all, uh, RF from any source, this is radio frequency, microwave uh, uh, energy, electromagnetic fields, uh, are now classified by the World Health Organization as possibly causing cancer, as a, a class 2B carcinogen. And that's the same category as lead, as chloroform, uh, you know, many other um, uh, hazard, known hazards. And increasingly, uh, medical organizations are sounding the alarm that, you know, the, the, that this RF uh, energy is cumulative, that the, uh, that the exposures are to be avoided where possible, uh, and so to put these on everyone's home in close proximity to them, because proximity is really key when we're talking about exposures, uh, and in an involuntary or, or coerced way where you're charging people a fee to remove it, 
uh, is, is really deeply immoral, um, given that the science, you know, that we know. Uh, we know that uh, RF uh, technology is associated with autism um, in children and ha has particular effects on the developing fetus, pregnant women, uh, elderly people, people with, with uh, autoimmune disorders. Uh, it's associated with cancer, leukemia, uh, and, you know, maybe not everyone who uses a cell phone is going to come down with cancer, but we don't know that. And as we look at the epidemiological evidence, we see the rates of brain cancer increasing. Um, there is a lag time between when exposures happen and when you see medical consequences. Mm -hmm. So we could all be going around holding cell phones to our head, uh, and then in 10 years, you know, um, there's this huge brain ca cancer epidemic. Um, and we can't, we're not, at that point, we're not going to be able to go back and change our behavior 10 years before. We need to be informed about the, the, uh, the science and make decisions about the safety of our families based on the independent science, not on what social norms are mm -hmm. or what government or industry tells us. And that is, that is a, a, a really crucial thing that, you know, if, if you're listening to this and you think, oh, well, you know, I'll wait for, you know, something to tell someone to, in authority to tell me not to do this. That is not going to happen until the, the bodies are in the street. It really, you know, looking at history, uh, we don't see a, a precautionary approach, and that has to be taken by the individuals and within the, mm -hmm. the communities um, mm -hmm. that, that, that we, we, where we live. Well, there is, there is the question of business ethics, and we know that uh, there are ethical businesses and ethical people in business, and there are unethical businesses. I mean, the situation that developed just recently where Volkswagen was shown to have specifically designed extremely sophisticated software to hide the emissions of their diesel, um, you know, their modern diesel cars is a, you know, perfect example of that. Yeah, and in fact, you know, our, our, I would say that our capitalist system rewards, uh, uh, you know, inaccuracies, rewards uh, uh, industries uh, um, manipulating the truth and the science in order to make more of a profit. That really is the goal. Profit is the bottom line. And, uh, you know, in, in some ways, uh, the, the, these people and these industries are behaving exactly as they are expected under the system, um, which, which, you know, puts uh, profit above uh, health and safety. And as a, as a public, uh, we, we have the obligation and, and the duty to inform ourselves and to organize and resist. And that is what uh, our organization, StopSmartMeters.org, has uh, has, has assisted people in doing for more than five years now. And your, your position is that whether you're hypersensitive or not, uh, these are a health hazard to everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, you know, w what we believe is that uh, there needs to be a wired system of communications. There needs to be uh, analog meters. There needs to be uh, a decentralized energy system where we generate power within our own communities and we control the resources. They're not controlled by a, uh, a hostile, oftentimes hostile, utility industry. Uh, and that, you know, we shift from the use of wireless technology, which we've launched into without a great deal of forethought, um, and provide fast, secure, high-speed, wired Ethernet, Internet everywhere. Uh, and what, you know, it's not that the wireless technology that people are 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 wanting. It's the information that's provided, and you know, how, well, the convenience of the service, the, convenience, the fact yeah. that you're not constantly running up new cable lines in your house. If Wi-Fi just makes it so much simpler, yeah. And the and the industry will say, you know, we we reject. Uh, you know, we don't think there's a need to tether yourself to a to a, uh, a Ethernet cable or something or a computer. And you mm -hmm. know the consequence of not of untethering of having a device in your pocket constantly that has the internet on it i think has wrought terrible uh, consequences on our social lives not to mention you know the, the the constant exposure so you know you know obviously people going out to a meal together it's this you know this this frustrating situation now where you try and talk to people and they're on their phones and they're distracted, they're not present. And uh, not to mention the, um, the growing uh, toll of road casualties from people who are distracted by their cell phones in their cars. Mm -hmm. So yes, I mean, when you think about it, there, 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 there's probably a case to be made for mm -hmm. a, an emergency alert system that is wireless uh, on some mm -hmm. level uh, that, you know, you, you're driving in your car, you break down somewhere, you can press a button and get 
you know, help. That, that's sort of a sensible use for wireless because it's a mobile use. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when you have multiple towers streaming uh, tons of data, you know, streaming video, uh, things that aren't really, you know, required. I mean, I think 50% of the, of, the, of the data stream that people use on the Internet is pornography, you know, and, and, and that's a ridiculous reason to get a brain tumor or to, to put your uh, community at, at, at risk uh, of, of radiation-caused illnesses. Um, but, uh, you, you know, when you have uh, things like smart meters, which are not mobile, they're fixed to your house, they could easily... Uh, if, if, a, if a utility company wanted to devise a system where they, you know, have the your reading sent through a phone line, for example, that's completely doable. Um, this is an inappropriate use of mobile technology. Um, it should never have, you know, we, RF sh- technology should never be used for uh, involuntary fixed location exposures like a like a smart meter. It's, it's you completely don't have, you don't have ridiculous. A Whereas with a, a mobile phone, you can set it down. You can. That's the key. You know, yeah, with, all, with most of this technology, mm-hmm. you can turn it off. You can mm-hmm. choose not to buy it. Mm-hmm. You can get it away from you. Mm-hmm. But when some, when an electricity electricity company um, mm-hmm. comes in, and we do, you know, in today's modern age, we do depend on electricity. It's, it's something that that. Uh, we depend on and for them to say that we're going to put this on your house you can't turn it off you can't have it removed unless of course you pay this illegal fee uh it is really really not acceptable and um you know there's people it's not just me in the last uh m- several months we've been meeting with people who are affected by this uh throughout the county um there's a woman on c road who uh didn't know that the meter was installed she started feeling sick she called psrec she said you know this I'm concerned about this. I really want to get it off. They said, oh, the meter is not transmitting all the time. It only transmits once a month, which is a lie. It does. It transmits all the time, and the meter reader comes around and, and picks up passively those those constant pulses. So they're, the PSREC is lying to people. Uh, they're giving people... They're they're forcing uh, people who are suffering from the effects of these meters to pay a fee uh, to avoid it, which is extortion. Uh, another uh, woman just lives outside of Quincy, a very mul- uh, very electrically hypersensitive and uh, uh, sensitive to multiple chemicals. Uh, she's very sick and barely take care of herself. Is on absolutely low income. Um, PSREC is still requiring her to pay this $141, $15 a month to, to, to keep the analog $141 on her $141 for the hookup? Yeah. So, you know, and she's having to pay for it out of the money that she would pay, being paying for for food, having to, you know, which is, I just, you know, think that that is completely unacceptable. The community should not tolerate that uh, when people who are vulnerable are being abused, you know. Um, and And so our case has not changed that uh, and PSREC needs to drop these fees and to allow anyone in the county to use an analog or to sell free their analog for no fee. Let's back up, um, Josh, to the differences between a uh, traditional analog uh, meter, which is electric mechanical, and the AMI and the AMR. Now, the the analog meter, I think most of us understand, is a meter that doesn't send signals. It's just a meter that that registers the amount of electricity that's passed into the house from the grid. So uh, the position of uh, the the cooperative is that the AMI is a true smart meter and the AMR is not. And they also argue, as you just said a moment ago, that this uh, system, um, I think the term that you used last year, the AMR is a bubble up where it, it can be, it can be, initiated at any time by the utility it, it but it it may not be sending signals seven days a week 24 hours a day it may just occasionally send signals and they, their argument is that that's a radio meter in fact that they call it that rather than radio frequency to i think try to make a distinction between that in the ami what distinctions do you think exist between these two not many you know they're trying to make it sound benign um like you know radios are first of all when you have a radio in your house it's passive it's not emitting any radio frequency Mm -hmm. Um, and people think of radios as generally benign which you know Mm -hmm. more or less they are Mm -hmm. uh but the their amr smart meters are emitting the same type of pulsed radiation as pg&e's ami meters are so uh the the similarities between PSREC's AMR meters, which don't have a mesh network or connect to each other or 
convey their message, their data to a cell tower. They depend on a, a utility personnel driving by to pick up the signal. The difference between those meters and PG&E's meters are in degree. And now PG&E's meters right here in Plumas County are the AMI that are AMI. 24-7. That's throughout Quincy and the uh, western part of, and northern part of uh, Plumas County, okay. PG&E territory. Okay. Um, so and your position is that those would be even more harmful than the AMR? Well, I, you know, I, I think that uh, they are uh, they are both very bad. Um, the levels of RF that are detected from the PG&E meters tend to be higher, but they're both uh, high levels, particularly if you're talking about a close range. If the okay. if your bed is on the opposite side of the wall mm-hmm. from one of these meters, mm-hmm. it's not it's not a, it's not a good thing. It's still emitting mm-hmm. high levels that mm-hmm. are above you know what um, many European countries uh, r- you know refuse to allow. Okay. All the smart meters, whether they're the PSREC ones or the PG&E ones, they're made of plastic. They emit radio frequency in a constantly uh, pulsed way. Uh, they overcharge you. There's a security risk, and the security risk is even higher when you have the AMI system because the AMI, the PAG, PG&E uses, uh, they have a, a, a remote disconnect switch, which means someone in the PG&E office can press a button and your power will be disconnected. And so that's you know that's not a really smart thing or really wise thing uh, if you uh, have people in your community who are vulnerable, who depend on electric equipment, medical equipment, for example, and there's a mistake made at the central office, you might you know, end up you know, really mm-hmm. killing someone uh, if you disconnect the wrong person's house. Uh, but the, the remote disconnect switch also raises the possibility of, of uh, uh, really systemic uh, vulnerabilities on a national security level. Because if you, you know, as we know, you can hack into almost yeah. anything that the internet is connected with. And right. if these if these meters can be turned off remotely, you could switch mm-hmm. off someone's individual meter or a community or a city, or you could possibly d- disconnect the whole country uh, for an extended period of time. And when you have you know a blackout for a night or two, that's an inconvenience. But when it's five days, six days, a week, two weeks, you're talking about major civil unrest, disruption. Um, we depend on electricity for right. everything from food right. to waste, right. disposal to everything else. Right. Uh, I'm going to do a, just a program identification. This is The Common Good. I'm Joseph Munoz, your host. My guest this morning is Joshua Hart, who is the National Director of St- Stop Smart Meters. Okay, uh, Joshua, the, the, I, I'm trying to get a, a real fix on the, this AMR versus um, AMI. Mm-hmm. And um, again, PSREC says that unequivocally that their meters are not smart meters. Mm -hmm. So this is a dispute between uh, advocates who are pushing for sensible energy policies, such as stop smart meters and our allies, and the industry who are uh, pushing their various technologies into the communities and trying to get people to accept them. Uh, So would you say that industry, that utility companies generally say that the AMR is not a smart meter? Utility companies are very narrow in 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 their definition of what a smart meter is. They refer to only AMI systems, which are a mesh network, the kind of meters and the kind of system that PG&E uses as smart meters. We uh, And then they say, well, there's AMR meters, there's digital meters, there's all sorts of other meters. Um, we found that people are very confused by this, and I think that is probably the intention of, of muddying the waters here. We say that any digital meter, any meter that, is, that has digital electronic components has the potential to have the full functionality of an AMI meter. Therefore, it is a smart meter. Anything that's electronic is a smart meter. Anything that's non-electronic is an electromechanical analog meter, okay. which makes it really simple for people. Okay. Um, and it groups similar types of meters like the AMR and AMI mm-hmm. systems together while making it clear that analog is, is in its own category. And to make things even more confusing, uh, and, and the industry has been installing what are called Trojan horse analog meters that look like analogs with a spinning disc but have a transmitter in them. Um, and they're actually charging people. And Southern California Edison is actually charging people an opt-out fee for this fake analog meter that's continuing to transmit and continuing to have all the problems of a uh, smart meter, of, a, of an ordinary smart meter. So this is really, you know, there's a series of, of deceptions. Uh, and unless you're following this, like, really closely as your full-time job, mm-hmm. <laughs> which we are, you know, not, not many other people are, you won't 
realize this stuff. You know, okay. you won't get to the bottom of it. So we, okay. we try to make it really clear for people. And, um, and you know, the, the, the solution is to really t uh, demand an analog and not take no for an answer and to realize that you have the right and the, uh, uh, the legal backing to uh, demand that analog and not to pay your opt-out fees as a, as a um, form of resistance. Okay. All right. Uh, Joshua, in your opinion, have utility companies, whether municipal, investor-owned, uh, like Edison, PG&E, or San Diego Gas and Electric, and rural electric cooperatives been transparent regarding the introduction of smart meters and what they enable companies to do? Uh, they've been the opposite of transparent. They've been extremely opaque. Uh, and for something that has cost us billions of our taxpayer and ratepayer dollars, this is our money that they're spending. Uh, these are decisions that affect us uh, as a communities as, and, and as individuals. Um, billions of our, of, our, of our dollars have been spent. Uh, they, they have not had consultations in advance of rolling out these, uh, these programs. Uh, you know, they have this kind of arrogant attitude where, pe you know, they think people aren't going to understand it and they just um, are going to force these things. Uh, and to, in order to force these, these, pr these systems, they've had to r rely on coercion, on extortion, on misrepresentation of the facts, on a huge and coordinated propaganda campaign um, organized by the Smart Grid Consumer Collaborative, which is anything but related to consumers, it's, it's all an industry group. If we could back up just a minute, you said there was no um, notice given at all. Like they have a magazine, what's it called, Rural Light? Is mm -hmm, it? Mm -hmm. Are you certain that there was nothing in Rural Light before they started introducing these AMR meters? Well, I, you know, it's possible that there was a sentence or two, but in terms of such a huge decision and a huge outlay and investment and a, a change of direction in, in uh, energy policy, they, you know, PG, both PG&E, the Public, Public Utilities Commission in the state, the local energy cooperatives should have had meetings to propose this. Uh, they should have had detailed consultation efforts, um, but none of that was forthcoming. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, we, are, we should not be obligated to pay a fee to avoid a technology which we had no input in deciding whether or not this is appropriate for our community. Mm. Uh, and, you know, when advocates such as us and other advocates who are involved Involved in trying to shed light on these crimes, because they are crimes, uh, when we try and engage with the system uh, and uh, uh, you know submit documents to the Public Utilities Commission, um, you know w w often there's a, uh, a reaction of repression rather than openness. For example, uh, early on in our campaign against PG&E, uh, the head of PG&E Smart Meter Program, William Devereaux. Uh, actually uh, used a false name to sneak into one of our discussion groups to obtain information about uh, what our strategy was, what our legal strategy was, and to try and disrupt the group. Uh, and he was uh, uh, fired from PG&E, forcibly forced to resign, uh, but it was clear that this was a systemic thing, that PG&E and, and the PUC were communicating uh, about how to um, uh, uh, how to discredit their critics, uh, us, and uh, uh, eventually, uh, there was a proceeding at the CPUC in which uh, PG&E was uh, required to pay $390,000 to the state um, to compensate the public for their crimes. Uh, we were not compensated, and in fact, uh, subsequently, emails arose which indicated that the CPUC and PG&E uh, were discussing a settlement uh, agreement for this case before the pre-hearing conference before it even got started. So, so this this is a constant. Uh, 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 now how would how would information like that get out? It seems to me that would be highly confidential between law, you know, legal offices and. Well, the CPUC has, if you've been following this, the Public Utilities Commission, which regulates all the state utilities, has been racked by uh, allegations of bribery, of collusion. Um, Michael Peavy, who's the former president, stepped down at the end of last year, uh, really under a cloud. Um, the, he was being, he's being in, currently being investigated by uh, the Attorney General's office for bribery and collusion. Uh, and this is just one additional, uh, you know, uh, uh, aspect of that larger systemic uh, problem. Uh, you know, w w basically, um, the 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 question comes up in a lot of emails. in a lot of regulation, and that is, 
are the regulators in bed with the people that they're regulating? Yeah, I mean, there's no question. I mean, it's it's a it's an open secret. Uh, and uh, these emails came to light uh, as part of a lawsuit uh, from the city of San Bruno, sued California Public Utilities Commission and PG&E. Uh, there was an agreement to release a number of, of emails uh, that that were so these thousands of emails were released. We're still pouring over those emails uh, to try and you know get. Uh, uh, at the truth about what's going on here, but you, you one of those emails was related to this Ralph case because William Devereux, the former head of the PG&E Smart Meter program, used this false, false name Ralph to, to to try and uh, get into our our groups and uh, and you know there are a lot of other emails that came about, uh, including one in which a California Public Utilities Commission staffer, high up staffer, Marzia Zafar. Uh, uh, claimed that a 75-year-old woman who'd been disconnected in um, Santa Cruz County back in 2011 for refusing the smart meter uh, was just, um, you know, trying to get, uh, uh, trying to, um, you know, get ahead. Or I can't remember the exact terminology off, off the top of my head, but but it's clear that uh, that that rather than uh, uh, regulate PG&E, the CPUC was in fact egging them on to further abuse the public and to um, not treat people with, with respect. And that's a really serious thing when you talk about, you know, senior citizens uh, living alone. Um, and as winter approaches, many people depend on heat, electric heat. And well, that's a serious, and, really and, serious and there thing. are there are so many policies to try to protect people like that, like the lifeline where you can get for two or three dollars a month a landline if mm -hmm. you're an elderly person. Uh, living alone, and I think the CPUC is shifting that policy, the Lifeline policy, to be um, either uh, preferentially available or, or even only available uh, for mobile phones. Now, um, there, there was really an attempt by the industry to uh, remove what they consider outdated copper, uh, which is the landline network, and to uh, make mm -hmm. make everyone go wireless. And so, not only does that have public health consequences, but you know, you ha you have the quality. Uh, uh, deficit. You know, I'm sure we're all aware of when you use a mobile phone or Skype, you can get interrupted. The call quality isn't the same as a landline. And I think, you know, that is one of the things that we're going to need to fight uh, hard for is to preserve these landlines to uh, make sure that, you know, uh, safe wired communications continue to exist. Mm -hmm. Because the alternative is as more of us become electrosensitive because of the exposures, we're going to not only have that be cut off from our community and be difficult for us to, to um, you know, come into a town, but also cut off uh, because people can't use, simply can't use cell phones. Okay. Uh, Josh, let's shift to the question of privacy. Um, one of the things that's been raised uh, by your organization and others is that uh, potential invasions of privacy uh, are much more um, possible because of the existence of smart meters. Famously, uh, General Petraeus uh, quipped that government and big business interests can find out everything about you from your dishwasher. Now, what do you think he was implying? Can they? Um, what about this question of privacy? Yeah, well, with the analog meters, the, the, at the end of the month, they produce a reading of your total electric, electricity usage, your cumulative usage, mm -hmm. which the utility, utilities would use to bill you. Mm -hmm. That was all the information that they need to know out of your home. With digital meters, with smart meters, they're able to collect a, a much more um, granular and detailed uh, picture of what your activities are in your house. And that this is documented. Um, they can tell what appliances you're using, um, what time you wake up in the morning, uh, how many people are in the house, when you go to bed, whether you're away on vacation, uh, even what television you're, program you're watching based on the, uh, the electricity consumption patterns um, from your television. And, uh, you know, General Petraeus was aware of the smart grid, aware of the national security implications. Um, we know from the Washington Post that the NSA is using smart meter data to uh, add to uh, individual profiles uh, of people, particularly, you know, activists and particularly those who the government are, are, are watching for whatever reason. But yeah, through the, the technology does exist and it, 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 the technology has progressed faster and farther than we can um, impose kind of social norms or new ways of dealing with it. So f let me give you an example. Uh, with your dishwasher, uh, it could have a chip that's part of the home area network that could be transmitting directly to the smart meter. 
Um, so the, the, the chip could contain a microphone. Uh, you know, various appliances could, could contain microphones um, for, you know, apparently uh, innocent reasons. It could, you know, have voice activation, for example. But we've seen uh, PlayStations and certain types of TVs with boxes that listen into what your conversation is in the room and perhaps make, you know, viewing choice recommendations to you based on that and of course all that speech is captured somewhere remotely sent back through the smart meter to the company or to the corporation and this is valuable information this is big data um, you know this is the internet of things and the you have a, a multitude of corporations who are um, salivating at the possibility of getting this really detailed information about what people do in their homes and selling that to third-party corporations um, be well, one example that I've uh, read about is that any food with pricing data on the on the box on the container uh, can be read by these modern smart refrigerators. Yeah, that is that is one thing. So you know, if you, have you a, eat a lot of spinach or you eat a lot of ice cream, they can know that yeah, <laughs> somehow. Yeah, you know, increasingly with radio frequency identification, RFID technology on food products, and with refrigerator refrigerators that can detect what's in your fridge. Some of them even like make recommendations about what you can eat this evening. You know, uh, recipes based on what you have in your fridge, uh, and uh, you, you know, but there's the the dark side to that is that uh, if you eat two pints of Ben and Jerry's in a night, it can report that information to your insurance company, to your medical insurance company, or to an employer, or you know, can, maybe to a, it can get involved in a child custody battle. You're not feeding your kid enough vegetables, so you know the, these are. Um, this is kind of like the nanny state, uh, and, I, and I say that in, in the most more specific ter terms of like, you know, we need to make sure that we're taking care of our kids in our communities. And that's not, you know, that's not something that corporations or electricity companies need to be extracting secretly the data out of your house and then keeping it in data banks that might appear years later in some court case. Um, but we, we know that, that law enforcement is uh, obtaining records of electricity usage to determine where marijuana grows are, um, that, you know, they are determining. Uh, uh, they are um, gathering data on on homes uh, that are under surveillance to determine whether someone was there during the commission of a crime. Uh, they are all they are obtaining this information without a warrant, uh, and, and and this really is a huge violation of the Fourth Amendment, and it has been um, you know analyzed by the Congressional Research Service and others. Uh, ACLU has been involved. Uh, but, but really, this is a constitutional violation, uh, and unless people get educated about it and realize what the implications of these smart meters going on their homes actually is, you know, this is not just some innocuous new technological device on your house. This so is, in a sense, it raises the constitutional issue of illegal search and seizure. It's actually, absolutely illegal search and seizure. Uh, the, your home is meant to be private, um, and, and the, the smart meter provides a conduit a direct conduit um, into the privacy of the home in order to uh, ascertain details that would otherwise be um, unobtainable. It's pretty spooky. It's very spooky. Yeah, it's very spooky. Uh, it, it, it's almost, um, you know, like an episode from the Twilight Zone. You know, the, 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 the utility comes around and, and the smart meters go on. People get sick and they're being spied on. And, yeah, I, I mean, I think people need to uh, – it, it's much easier to remain in denial about this issue. And I think, you know, denial is a psychological uh, uh, um, function that uh, we use to protect ourselves when – the um, reality becomes too difficult to handle. And I think there's a lot of denial around climate change. People don't want to think that our energy systems and our transportation systems and our corporate systems are causing uh, you know, uh, severe damage to the future habitability of the planet. We don't want to believe that these iPhones and iPads and wonderful, exciting devices that are so convenient uh, are are possibly going to give us cancer? Are possibly going to cause developmental problems with our kids? Um, but we need to, you know, face these problems and face the consequences of our technologies in a humane way, in a wise way, and make sensible public policy decisions. Mm. Okay. Last year at this time, um, I read prior to the uh, my interview with you that um, the Reno Gazette had just reported 
the opinion of the Sparks and Reno fire chiefs that a number of house fires had been caused by smart meters, one of which allegedly led to the death of Michelle Sherman, a Reno resident. Has any more been made public on this issue of possible fire uh, danger uh, since last year? Well, first of all, I want to uh, let people know that Michelle Sherman has not been the only person uh, who's been killed uh, through a fire started by smart meters. Uh, there, uh, are, there have also been uh, many other people who've, who've lost their lives, who've been injured, or who've lost all their possessions. There have been uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of fires and explosions and uh, uh, other safety-related problems related to smart meters. Uh, pardon me a second, mm -hmm. uh, Joshua. Um, what, what evidence do the fire chiefs have or fire security people have that allows them to come to this conclusion? Well, uh, in, specifically in Reno, um, the, the Sparks and Reno fire chiefs spoke out after dozens of fires uh, that were suspicious and connected to the metering systems uh, were uh, reported. So they so their investigators the, concluded that the fire started at well, the meter. Well, in many cases, uh, the utility, Nevada Energy, would arrive right after the fire was reported and remove the meter, uh, which makes an investigation very difficult. And this has happened all over the United States, in Canada, there's been a systemic effort by utilities to hide the evidence. Um, and even to this day, despite the, all these reports, uh, uh, the utility industry says that the fire, that the, the meters were consumed. They never use the word smart meter fires. They'll, if you ask them how many smart meter fires they, there have been, they'll still say zero, which is completely uh, ridiculous and not supported by the evidence at all. Um, on the one hand, we have uh, uh, reports of smart meters causing fires, and this is likely the result of uh, moisture penetration into the meter, of temperature variations, of electronic circuitry going wrong, uh, and finally, of you know, smart meters are made of plastic. Uh, they're very cheaply made. So if there is a, a meter that gets hot, uh, smart meter is much more likely to combust and start the rest of your house on fire, whereas the older style standard analog meters are made metal. of metal and glass and are not as susceptible to melting and or starting fires. So uh, after this death of Michelle Sherman, which was tragic, her and her she and her pets uh, were perished in, in a fire in Reno, uh, there was an investigation. Uh, the um, Nevada Public Utilities Commission uh, launched an investigation, which is still ongoing. Uh, the underwriters Laboratory uh, analyzed, I think, 30 or 40 of these meters and found them uh, to not be faulty. Uh, but that doesn't, you know, th that that conclusion does not affect the fact that there have been meters that multiple have, that have not. Uh, this underwriters study were presumably meters that are on an existing building and have not caught fire well these were meters that were provided by nevada energy to underwriters laboratory oh, they were done and they were tested I in a laboratory see. they were okay. uh, exposed to you know water and, and okay. these things and they, oh, they said they, they passed okay. okay but the reality is that in the field these are still causing fires they're still leading you know to property damage and risks there was a guy who i, I uh, had a good part of his face uh uh, um, injured by a smart meter exploding um, in, right in Reno. Uh, and there, there's been fatalities in Texas. There have been fatalities in, uh, there was a fatality in Vacaville in 2010. So it, it's, again, uh, it's the utilities putting their profits because they can manufacture these, these meters cheaper uh, in Mexico and with plastic. And, you know, uh, they're saving money. They're making more money for their investors. And, you know, the public uh, and our safety is paying the price. All right. Thank you, Josh, for being with us this morning. Uh, this is KQNY 91.9 FM, and the program is The Common Good. My guest this morning has been Joshua Hart. I'm Joseph Munoz. Thank you for listening. Okay. Well, thank you so much again, Joseph, for having me on a uh, second time and for uh, asking uh, the great questions that will really, you know, uh, reveal the truth in this situation. Uh, I wanted to remind people who are listening that they can get involved in our campaign uh, by going on to stopsmartmeters.org or by emailing josh at stopsmartmeters.org. Um, you know, we encourage people to uh, uh, refuse to allow a smart meter on their home anywhere 
here uh, to demand an analog and not take no for an answer. And uh, we're, we remain available to help people with legal efforts uh, or practical efforts related to that. Um, in addition, we have an online store on our website uh, that sells uh, electromagnetic field testing meters so people can assess uh, what their uh, environments, the safety of their own environments. And uh, just would encourage people to, to get involved, to learn more about this issue, and to uh, become more active in our community. I think you know, we, we can rid Plumas County and the rest of the world from these smart meters, but we need awareness and we need action. So we invite you to join us in that.